Sherry Rice, is that you? Yeah, hey, how are you? Can you hear me? I'm not hearing you, but let me just see here. See if you're muted. Anyway, Shana Tova, Gamar Hatima Tova. You want to go to uh, Phil? You're going to go upstairs? Hi, Diane. Shana Tova. I think you guys are muted. Ah, now I hear something. I don't know if that's you or that's David. How are you doing? How are you doing? Thank you. Thank you. We're doing well. How was your rest of Shana? It was, it was actually quite nice. It was very cold. Yeah. And I've been so, um, and we, we had two minyan and we had an 8.45 minyan, went to 11, and we had 11 to like one o'clock minyan. And so we davened at the 8.45 and my, my hands were blue. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, listen, it was considering, you know, the options, it was good. Okay, so get some rest. How are you guys? We're good. We're we good. were in New Jersey we and were. I davened outside and it was freezing, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Good. We oh. we uh. That's we went wonderful. With children, and will Eric is there? Eric. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We have a daughter and a son, both living in Teaneck, and okay. uh, we we made arrangements to go to the outdoor minion at the Young Israel of Teaneck. She is sixteen years old and loves baseball. Most of all, he <laughs> likes to pitch. But what I didn't realize is that they were having. Four outdoor minions at different locations. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's what people do. That's what they're doing. Felix, is that you? Yes. Shanatova. Good. Yes, yeah, Shanatova. I'm obviously not seeing people. <laughs> yeah. We were sure. Yes. Yes, I was there. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. I heard it was great. It was great. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Okay. Done as well. Everybody good? All right. Should I uh, should I get the show on the road then? Yeah, David. Sure. I think it's uh, it's seven o'clock. Yeah. I don't and know if you're Polish, but you can be a Yeki. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, at least on a fast day, I'm gonna I'm gonna be prompt here. So. <laughs> okay, go for it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. so in the uh, in the in the last you know, sessions, there we spoke a little bit of Polish history, uh, Polish Jewish history in the modern era, uh, <clears throat> taking us through World War II. So uh, we're we're not going to try and you know wrap up uh, the things that have happened since then, which uh, again, recognizing to leave a lot out. So. Certainly. Um, obviously, World War II, the Holocaust disaster for Polish Jewry. Um, again, as with all these things, estimates are going to vary, but roughly 90% uh, were murdered, right? So of a 3.3 million before the war, you know, give or take, uh, only about 300,000 survived. Um, and, and somewhat ironically, um, anybody know what most of those of Poland's pre-war Jewish population that survived had in common? Right, of the 300,000 or so Polish Jews who survived, well, what, 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 what was the, the common feature that, in most cases, offered them uh, the key to survival? They were Polish. Uh, yeah. No, that, <laughs> that was extraordinarily unhelpful during the war. <laughs> Maybe they spoke different languages and were able to pass for... No, nope. 
<laughs> no. Nope. This, this is what makes it ironic is that in 1939, when, as we spoke about last week, the Soviets uh, took over the eastern part of Poland and they sent a million and change Poles into exile or into not exile, into uh, uh, various camps in the Soviet Union. They also sent several hundred thousand Jews into camps in the Soviet Union. Um, and what seemed in 1939 and 1940 to be a disaster, right, being sent to uh, labor camps in, in the Soviet Union actually proved to be salvation um, uh, because a lot of those Poles and Polish Jews were freed from those camps after the, uh, the Germans invaded, right? There was an amnesty given. That's again how, how you know, Begin ended up in the Middle East and so forth. But you know, even those who ended up in the camps, you know, obviously most of the, there were some fairly awful Soviet camps, but uh, for the most part, the Polish Jews weren't sent there. A lot of them ended up in Central Asia and so forth, um, where, you know, life was not pleasant, but certainly in comparison to what life was like for the Jews who remained in Poland was, was far preferable, right? And this, this is going to be significant later on. So um, when, when the war ends and, and all the things get sort of tallied up, the vast majority of pre-war Polish Jews who survived, 200 plus thousand, um, survived in, uh, in, in Russia, right? Did not actually live under German occupation. Um, it, the, the war was also really a disaster for Poland as well. Um, you know, 3 million Polish Jews die, uh, perhaps 3 million Poles die. Again, we'll talk about in a minute, you know, those, those numbers. Um, Poland suffered, you know, probably higher uh, percentage of casualties than any other country in Europe, maybe even more than uh, the Soviet Union. Um, Warsaw was destroyed, or there, you guys probably know about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in 1944. In September, there was a Warsaw Uprising. Um, the Poles had been sort of waiting for the moment when liberation was at hand, and they were going to try and liberate Warsaw themselves uh, before the Soviets arrived. And again, there's a legitimate historical debate on why the Soviets stopped, but um, the Soviets stop near Warsaw, the Poles rise up, uh, and the Germans decide that they're going to level Warsaw in, in punishment. Um, and not only does that happen, but Poland itself is completely reformed. And if you look over here at the map, you'll see this. The, 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 the pink was the area that was Poland prior to World War II. Um, and uh, when... When the Soviets took over the eastern part, the crazy, the border region, they incorporated those elements into the Soviet Union itself, right? They took Ukrainian speaking parts, made a part of Ukraine, they took Belarusian parts, made a part of Belarus. Um, and they're not inclined to give that back to Poland. The problem, of course, is, is Poland was an ally, right? Uh, you know, uh, the, the Poles had, you know, been on the, the that side of things. And so the decision is made um, with, uh, with, you know, between the British and the, the Soviets to some extent, that what they're going to do is sort of shift over the borders of Poland, right? Churchill sort of famously um, takes uh, like three matches and sort of says, oh, we're going to, it's like moving these matches, right? It's just sort of move this match over here and this match over here and, you know, now they're in, in, in place. So what's going to happen is the Poles are going to lose those parts of Poland that the Soviets had occupied in the East, right? That's part of the Soviet Union now. Um, the population there was not ethnically Polish, but Poland is going to get in exchange for this um, German territories, many of which had been Polish before you know the 19th century, um, but but certainly did not have many Poles in them at this point. Uh, many, if if at all, in many cases, largely German populations. But the, the idea was basically uh, Poles would leave. The eastern parts of the uh, of Poland, right? And the Poles would then be resettled in certain areas. The German will be um, so. So Poland, after the war, is undergoing sort of massive upheaval. Uh, not just political upheaval. I'm not even going to get into that. But you know, so we and, and although there've been promises that Poland would be allowed government and choose their own government, 
the Soviets who make it clear that they are imposing communist rule. There's, there's, there's political upheaval, there's demographic upheaval, um, and, and there's actual sort of just geographic upheaval in the sense that the borders are completely redrawn and everything has to be uh, done over. Um, and just some sense of the numbers, uh, again, there, there, a lot of these numbers even today are still um, in flux, right? I mean, um, we don't know how many Poles died in World War II. We don't know how many Ukrainians of uh, Polish citizens died. Some argue that it's three million Poles. That tends to be, again, a Polish nationalist kind of perspective. There are others who argue that, well, you know, three million non-Jewish Polish citizens died, but perhaps only two million were Poles and another million were Ukrainians. Or 1.5 million Poles died. I don't know, but a lot of Poles, let's say about two million ethnic Poles, uh, you know, died in the war as well. Um, and and fun little fact here. Anybody, you, you guys have probably heard the number, some of you people talk about the 11 million victims of the Holocaust, right? Six million Jews and five million non-Jews. Anybody know where that number comes from? The yeah. six million, we, we, we know, but, but anybody know where the idea that there were five million non-Jewish uh, victims of the Holocaust that, that comes from? Is it from the Germans? Is it from what? The Germans. No, no. <laughs> it's completely fictitious. It, it's made up by Simon Wiesenthal. So when, when the Americans were planning to make the Holocaust Museum, the one down in uh, D.C., Jimmy Carter you know, wants to know, you know, well, okay, when I got to make some speech, well, where do these numbers, what, what are the numbers? And Wiesenthal makes up this number, 11 million. What he wants to do is create a, a number, 5 million non-Jews, which is large enough that non-Jews will see some kind of uh, vested interest in a Holocaust museum, right? That they'll see it as something which isn't just Right, Jewish parochial concern, but still smaller than the number of Jews. Um, in, in real terms, right, if you want to look at Eastern Europe, far more non-Jews died in Eastern Europe than Jews died, right? 20 to 30 million Soviets died, right? I mean, um, not in camps, but, you know, certainly died. So the, the actual number of non-Jews killed by German, under German occupation is actually far larger than 6 million. The number of non-Jews killed in the camps is far smaller than 5 million. Right. This is all just uh, you know, created by Wiesenthal here. No, just, it was just nonsense, just something he made up, right? It's not, not an aggregate of anything, it's just a, a I heard there were much more than six million Jews that died by someone who worked at the UJA who was doing research. Uh, again, the, the, the number six million is a rough figure. There are very reputable historians who would say the number was less. They're very reputable historians who might push the number up a little bit, not a lot, um, right? I mean, uh, Raoul Hilberg, who is one of the sort of leading figures in uh, Holocaust history, um, has argued that if you really want to be sort of precise about this stuff, um, X number of Jews were going to die, like die, right? Just people die because they, they die and that you know, every year people die. Um, that number of people actually killed was probably closer, Jews killed, let's say, probably closer to five and a quarter million or something like that, because obviously every year X number of Jews would be dying anyway. Um, you, you can't have much more than six million um, just because the, the demographics from before the war weren't there. So I, again, without knowing who this person is or what, what statistics or data he's found, um, you know, you, you might go a little higher than six, but it can't be much more just because. Um, there were that many people there. Yeah, right. Three more pop populations are, aren't there. So, um, okay. Anyway, um, but but yeah, some of these things are still not going to be you know really ever known. Okay, so the, the the disaster that befalls the Jews, the disaster that befalls Poland, the disaster that befalls Poles, creates some new possibilities, but we're going to see sometimes somewhat contradictory possibilities. So when, when the war ends, there may only have been about 15,000 Jews in pre-war Poland, um, right? As the Soviets come in, um, some Jews are left behind in the camps, right? There were some small amounts left behind in Auschwitz and some of these other places. Jews start coming out of hiding. Um, but, you know, there, there were basically no Jewish communities left in, in Poland, you know, at, at the end of World War II. 
what you do find though is that in uh, Gross Rosen, which is in Lower Silesia, which was part of Germany, um, liberated by the, the Soviets in January 45, roughly the same time, uh, like a week later or so after, uh, after Auschwitz. Um, there are about 20,000 Jews, right? This is another fairly large camp complex. Um, a lot of Jews had been taken out into death marches, but you still had about 20,000 Jews left. Now, this is in the area that's, that's slated for Polish control after the war. Um, and most of these are Polish Jews, right? They've been Jews who've been moved from other camps in Poland into Gross So sort of by default, the largest Jewish population in Poland at the end of World War II is in the area of Lower Silesia, right? Which had been, um, you know, a, a part of Germany for a uh, hundred 80 years or so by that point, 200 years actually closer. Um, but it's going to be Polish in the future. Um, and a lot of these Jews, some probably go home and look for their families. They don't find anything. Some realize there's nothing to go back to. And so a lot of these Jews end up staying in this area. Um, and in the next few years after World War II, from about 1945 to uh, 1949 or so, um, 1948, actually, tens of thousands of Jews pour into Lower Silesia. Some of this is because the Soviets sort of task this as the exit point for Jews leaving Poland. So what happens in the war ends is you have this sort of weird um, funneling of Jews. Jews begin coming in from the east, from the Soviet Union. Right now they're, they're allowed to go back home. They come home, they find that there's nothing left for them. And they, many of the cases, keep on moving west through Silesia. Some of them, however, stay uh, in Lower Silesia, at least for a few years, because what, what ensues is this weird experiment, right? Um, where you have a bunch of Jewish activists who come to Lower Silesia, Polish Jews, again, co Zionists, communists, uh, people like Poland, on left, or basically Zionist communists, um, who see here an opportunity to convert Lower Silesia into this kind of Jewish statelet, right? And understand that, that prior to World War II, there had been, you know, in the Jewish community, you know, various ideas about this, right? You had, you had groups called the Focus who wanted to create sort of a, an autonomous zone uh, in the Russian Empire. And then in Poland, you had groups like the Bund um, who had helped to create sort of a, uh, a, a Yiddish uh, autonomous culture in Poland. Um, and, and they see here a chance to perhaps do this, right? There's still possibly a couple hundred thousand Polish Jews left. Um, and there's this opportunity here to build some, some real Jewish institutions, which they go about doing. And we're not going to watch the whole thing because it's 11 minutes long in Yiddish and I can't understand most of it. Um, but if you go, actually, you can go on YouTube, look up uh, Jews Silesia 1947. And you'll find, I'll see if I can get this thing to, to run, this interesting um, sort of propaganda film in Yiddish made by, uh, I assume, some kind of you know, Jewish socialist or communist uh, in this period, 1947. Try, I don't know if it's going to get it to work. Trying to show off the, um, what the Jews are doing here um, and encourage, clearly, the target is Polish Jews to settle in uh, Lower Silesia. So let's, let's see if we can... All right, get this going here in a minute. Um, and if not, then I will proceed and, you know, you can look it up yourself on YouTube. But it's, it's again, it's 11 minute long film and it shows Jewish industrial workers. It shows Jewish miners and Jewish farmers, Jewish theaters, um, synagogues, right? Um, and, and the whole, you know, sort of idea that we have a chance here now to recreate or create our own little uh, ideal Jewish world um, within the framework of a, you know, sort of socialist utopia, right? Uh, one where we have cooperatives with where, where all this stuff. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's, it's worth my effort here. And, and understand one of the things that's feeding this or fueling this is where are these Jews living now in 1947 in Lower Silesia? What? Anybody take a guess? Well, the Germans are being expelled. Oh. And, so, 
And so Jews, depending on where they are, are finding towns, right? Uh, we'll see in a minute, um, where the German population is, is, has been driven out. The towns, in some cases, have not been damaged by the war. Um, and they're able to move into, right, perfectly intact, uh, you know, nice quality, middle income housing, right? Um, you know, around, around, around the same time that uh, Hillman is going up on the Lower East Side, um, you, you have this similar experiment in, uh, in Lower Silesia where, um, right, Germans are being driven out and this housing is, is open. And if, if you look over here, and we'll see, these are all images from this, the town of Reichenbach, um, which is then renamed Reichbach, or Richbach, I guess, uh, in, in Polish, trying to Polonize it. And then uh, uh, um named after some Polish uh, scientist, develops actually a Jewish majority, right? This is not a shtetl. This is a place where there were very few Jews before the war as a German town. Um, but for a brief period after World War II, um, this town has some 27,000 Jews out of a population of you know, 50,000 or so, maybe 30,000 Jews or so. Um, so slight Jewish majority, but like the Jewish majority in a lot of Jewish towns before the war. Um, full range of institutions. They have Hebrew schools, right? the Zionists are running schools in Hebrew, the Bundists are running schools in Yiddish. Um, you have theater groups. You have certainly a lot of Zionist uh, camps because again, a lot of people are hoping uh, to eventually make their way out to um, uh, Palestine. Um, excuse you me. Have, yeah. The communists were taking over by then. They weren't quite uh, taken over. So they yeah, allowed correct. Zionist activities? Okay, so, so when it comes to this, understand even in the Soviet Union, um, the, the, the Soviets allowed Polizion left, um, or Polizion small, to continue yeah. operating until 1928. Yeah, so, until Stalin, well, shortly before Stalin. Yeah. Uh, right, right. But, but also be, because, and, and it's actually interesting, I'm glad you brought that up, because in some respects it serves the same function here. One of the things, one, one of the sort of rationales in the 1920s was that the Soviets were looking for foreign aid. They were getting a lot of foreign aid from Jewish organizations that were helping to set up agricultural settlements for Jews and so forth in the Soviet Union in the 1920s. And so Poland's own small was... Uh, was sufficiently Marxist. I mean, it was a Marxist organization, um, if not Bolshevik, but it was a Zionist but Marxist and small enough that they felt they could allow it to continue operating as a fig leaf to say, hey, look, we're, we're, we're allowing the Zionist organization to continue operating. It wasn't threatening. A lot of the Polizio and small people just ended up you know, becoming you know, party members anyway. So by the same token, here in uh, in Poland in the late 1940s, right? These the, the the communist movement in Poland was extremely small before the war, uh, and, and in fact, Pol I, I didn't get into it when we spoke last week, but um, in 1938, the Soviet Union launched one of their crackdowns again during the purges on various ethnic groups. They launched one against uh, Poles in the Soviet Union, and as part of their sort of anti-Polish crackdown, that actually dissolved the Polish Communist Party. So even before World War II. So when they come in now, um, they're kind of looking for anybody who is, as, as we would say, a fellow traveler, yeah. right? Um, certainly communists, if you, you know, party members get rehabilitated. Um, a lot of the, again, the, the people coming back now, both Jews and Poles from the Soviet Union, um, some of them certainly are, were, were pre-war party members and so forth. Um, the Bund is willing to assist, um, and these guys too, right? So, the, the, you, right when we talk about the imposition of communism, and again, that's that's, that's a whole other set of classes. Um, and I'd recommend Anne Applebaum's book uh, on the Iron Curtain. Um, yeah, it's it's not that they come in in 1945 and say now we're communists. So there's a several yeah. year period where they they have to build up the institutions and create various things. So yeah, you're exactly right. for them. This is a, a way to use locals. Um, to serve some of their own purposes and give the impression that they're they're willing to create a kind of uh, you know multi-party system. Um, front. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I just saw a thing on the on the chat about uh, kosher meat and Poland. We can 
perhaps talk about that when when this uh, when we get to the end of this class because that brings us to the modern time. Um, all right. So the uh, can yeah, I just say, can I just say something? I, yeah. There are many Jews that were saved in the Soviet Union. They yeah. may not have had any communist or socialist aff yeah. affiliation before the war, but yeah. they felt that the Soviets had saved their lives yeah. in some brutal way, and it was br all brutal. Nothing yeah. was easy in the Soviet Union during those years, but they did feel this aff aff uh, this affection. For the Soviet Union, yes, very, it's I, very important. I knew people like this. They eventually became disaffected. It is, yeah. you know, but they did think that they may be, they could be, and the Soviets used them actually yeah. to establish this little camp. Yeah, they were being good. manipulated. They didn't. It didn't last very long, as you're going to say probably yeah. now. But yeah, but also as we're going to see, like just in terms of creating the organs of control in Poland, um, yeah, that that what you said is very important. Um, all right, so look, in terms of understanding this process, why the polls allow this to happen, um, why it ultimately fails, um, you know, you, you have this kind of, again, um, harmonic convergence, let's say, that takes place. So look back at the names you said. It goes from Reichenbach, German name, Reichenbach, which is perhaps some sort of Polonized German name, and then Zarzaniok, right, completely Polish name. Right. That 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 provides a real key to understanding the the space that's allowed for this experiment. Poland is now laying claim to this German territory. They've got to colonize it, right? In the same way that the Germans were colonizing Poland, let's say during World War II, the, the Poles are now flipping that back. We are emptying out the Germans, but and this is really important because again, nobody at this point knows what's going to happen two years down the road. Right, um, or one year down the road, we need to put poles in this uh, in this area. Um, and you know, you know, there's the, the sort of famous uh, uh, quote by Einstein, whether he said it or not, that if you know his theories are proven correct, then um, the Frenchman, then the, the 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 Germans will say he's a German, and the French will say he's a citizen of the world. If his theories are proven incorrect, the French will say he's a German, and the Germans will say he's a Jew. All right. So, um, so by the same token, right? In this case, and this is something which you, you know you again makes sense in in Eastern Europe and even Polish history before World War One. The Germans, not the Germans, the Poles are seeing the Jews now as sufficiently Polish, right? Because whatever the case, whatever whatever bad blood there may be between the Poles and the Jews, let's say. The, the Poles certainly understand that the Jews have no desire for the Germans to return to Silesia, right? So in this context, right, the Jews, the, the Poles are happy, let's say, are happy enough with Jews colonizing the lower Silesia, um, at least in the short term, because in this case, they're not seeing them as Jews, they're seeing as Polish citizens who uh, will at least have some preference for Polish rule to German rule, right? Um, so, yeah, at this point, the Poles are like, okay, great. We, we want to move as many Poles, whatever that means, let's say, into this area. Um, if right now it's going to be Jews, then so be it, let it be Jews. May I just but, ask a question? Is yeah, this sure. the same area? Is this the Vartland area that Himmler removed the Poles okay. from and no. br brought in ethnic Germans actually to live in? Right. So, so, so further west. So, Vartland, uh, uh, the Vartagau, was actually Polish territory which the Germans were then trying to colonize. Silesia is German territory, which uh, again, uh, if you go back, you know, to, to I don't want to go because it's just going to get caught up when I get to some things, that, that at the end of World War II, the Allies basically give the Soviet Union the eastern part of Poland, but to compensate for that, they give them the eastern part of Germany and most of East Prussia. Right. So this is territory which had been German territory before World War II. And now the Germans are being expelled and fleeing. And now it's going to be Polish territory. But it's the same basic idea. Right. They're just flipping. it. Um, but, I, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Uh, I think I'll do some classes in the future on the, the, the planning and implementation of the final solution. And certainly we'll talk about what happens in the, in the Vartagal. Anyway, um, so the flip side of this, though, is that um, as we're going to see, th this, this 
willingness to tolerate this Jewish experiment only goes so far because at some point it's still one more pulse. And the flip side is that while there's certainly efforts to restore Polish Jewish life, not just in Silesia, and just focus on the next thing, it's fascinating. But there were Jews going back to Warsaw, there were Jews going back to Lodz and Krakow, where, wherever there were Jews, there were Jews going back to, um, not wherever, because you know, obviously that's efforts to set up schools, our communal Jewish organizations, there are dozens of Jewish schools operating in Poland uh, uh, by the summer of 1946. Um, uh, but you have now again the, the the continuation not only of the old school let's say um, Polish anti-Semitism including blood libels but Poles in many parts of Poland have a new fear regarding Jews. Anybody know what that new fear is? As the Jews come back to Poland, what do you think these a lot of Poles are concerned about? They're going to take back their territory. They're going to take back their homes, right? Um, you know, and and you know perfectly understandable right i mean so the jews were gone we thought they're gone we moved into their houses um we've we've fulfilled the goal now we have reclaimed or claimed the polish cities but a lot of poles certainly have this concern that their upgrade is going to be taken away from them so you have and, and you have and we'll talk about this more in a minute what, what jeff suggested which is a lot of the jews coming back of course are seen and for very good reason as being friendly to the Soviets, right? Which also creates, right, tensions here. So again, we, we don't necessarily have good numbers. Um, the estimates I saw in looking up for this, between 1,000 and 2,000 Jews are killed um, in Poland after liberation in 45 and 46. Um, and again, because of what's going on in Poland, it's hard sometimes to gauge people are getting killed for all kinds of reasons, right? People are getting killed because they're Jews, people are getting killed because they're Ukrainians, because they're Polish nationalists, people are getting killed because they have clothes and somebody else wants them, right? So um, it's not 1,000 Jews, let's say, being killed specifically because they're Jews, but again, there's a lot of violence going on. But certainly many Jews are reporting that they're hearing uh, anti-Semitic slurs, they're physically attacked. Um, um, there's a lot of chaos, but certainly there's a lot of directed anti-Semitism. Um, and it's worth pointing out um, the, the Kielce pogrom, which is sort of the most notorious anti-Jewish uh, action in Poland at this time, is also a matter of historical debate, right? Historically speaking, this has been presented as Polish anti-Semites in the town of Kielce rising up and killing, um, I think, 46 Jews uh, in the town, many of them people who had returned to the town and lived there before the war. There's there's some pretty good evidence to suggest that um, the instigation of the pogrom were actually the Soviets, right? That, that again, this goes back to what you're talking about before, Joel. This is the time where the Soviets are trying to um, create um, support, not just within Poland, but sort of internationally, and to tarnish the reputation of the the right Polish nationalists or Polish liberals or Democrats, whatever term you want to use. Um, and if they can present the, the Polish sort of home army and so forth as being anti-Semites and murderous anti-Semites, it makes the case better that the Soviets need to help impose control. So there is evidence that the instigators were, were probably NKVD people. Um, but this is one of the situations where the truth is in the middle, right? Polish Nationalists want to say it wasn't us, it was the Soviets, but understand the instigators were Soviets, but a lot of the perpetrators or people who were involved were just local Poles who got caught up in right this stuff. So it, it does not exonerate the Polish participants. There were Polish participants. It just is more complex than just Poles rising up and killing Jews. Um, so Lower Silesia uh, doesn't last long as a Jewish chamber. Um, and, and there are a bunch of reasons for this, right? Um, uh, and again, for some ways, that's the layover, right? So it, it's an interesting thing, too, that in this period of 1947, it could look like Lower Silesia really had staying power. But a lot of the Jews who were there might only be there for a few months or weeks or whatever, maybe. So there were lots of Jews, but they weren't all the same place. But certainly the Kielce pogrom has a big impact on uh, Jewish decision making in 1946. And, and the best sort of um, example that some of you may be familiar with is what happens in 
uh, Palestine in 1948 with uh, what happens at, at, at Dir Yassin, right? A um, bunch of Palestinians are killed, right? The whole debate about that. But certainly Palestinians get the this, this sense, if we stay here, we're going to get killed. Well, same thing happens with Jews in Poland in 1946. Word of this program spreads and a whole lot of you know, Jews say, you know what, we don't need to stay here. So uh, a lot of people move for that reason. The creation of Israel creates a big incentive. Again, for if you were a, you know, again, and, and think about this, it's 1946. The British Empire is controlling Palestine. Who knows what's going to happen in the future, right? In 1946, uh, this little project you got going on in Lower Silesia might not be so bad, right? You might, you're living in a place with a Jewish majority of sorts. You know, people speak Yiddish. You've got these institutions. Well, 1948 comes along and Israel looks a lot better, right? This is a done deal. Um, along with that, with 1948, um, comes the Soviet backlash against Zionism. Again, the, the Soviet Union initially supported um, Zionists in, in 1947, 1948, um, for reasons maybe we'll discuss in a different class. Um, they, they turn against that very quickly. And when the Soviet Union begins closing the gates of emigration, um, I think probably a lot of Jews in Lower Silesia say, you know what, we better leave now because we might have a chance to leave in a year or two years. Or whatever it may be. Um, there's a Polish backlash that starts going against, well, look, it's an interesting thing. Prior to World War II, as you discussed, Poland had this polyglot multinational state. After all of the killing, after all of the demographic shifts, after the border changes, Poland now finds itself with what it had basically dreamed about, right? This, or what, what many Poles had dreamed about, let's say, certainly because there were multiculturalists, and essentially mono, uh, not monogamous, uh, homogenous Polish state, right? And if you ask the Catholic Church, monogamous as well. Monogamous, homogenous <laughs> Polish state, right? Um, the only exception now really being the Jews. So certainly there are Poles who are going to look at what's going on in Silesia and say, you know what? We have solved the Jewish problem. It's been solved, I guess, for us. We don't need to create another one. And it doesn't mean that the Poles are initiating any policies necessarily, but they're also not providing any great support for this, and they're still encouraging more Poles to move in, right? So again, if I'm a Jew living in in, in Jersey now in, uh, in 1947, things might be looking good, 1948, I might see more Poles moving into the region and thinking, yeah, I know where this ends up. And the last part is, you know, the facts, as I mentioned before, nobody knows what the future is going to bring. Right now, the Poles are laying claim to Lower Silesia. Maybe in five years, the Germans come back. Maybe in one year, the Germans come back. We, we don't know, right? So um, probably a lot of Jews are not necessarily confident about the future of this place for any number of reasons. And so by the 1940s, uh, late 1940s, let's say 1949, 1950, um, of the couple hundred thousand Jews who had come back to Poland after the war, you have only maybe 70 to 80,000 Jews left in Poland. Um, not nothing, but obviously a far cry from what you had before. Um, and unfortunately for, let's say, the Jews' place in, in Polish memory, a significant number do embrace, let's say, the opportunities presented by the communists. And, and again, often for very good reasons. Um, and, and, and I mentioned this in the beginning, but yeah, as Jeff said, look, a lot of these people view the communists and the Soviets as benefactors, right? Um, th they have lived in the Soviet Union for the last few years. They picked up some Russian. They had their experiences, good and bad. Uh, but, but these are people who are coming in now uh, with the Soviets and view them as, particularly what's going on, as the best protection against anti-Semitic violence, right? which is what the Soviets arguably wanted with things like the Council program. And um, some of them are veterans, actually, veterans of the yes, Soviet army. Yes, they're, they're Red Army soldiers who, you know, had, had joined up, and now they're, you know, settling down. Um, some see opportunities that the Poles had never provided, right? And this is one of those things, too, which I didn't really mention it in the uh, previous class, but, but 
look in terms of evaluating the anti-Semitism of the Polish government uh, in the interwar period, Jews represented a disproportionately well-educated class uh, among the Polish population in the 1920s and 30s. Almost none of them served in the civil service, right? Um, clearly not by their choice, right? Um, but by the po choice of the Polish government. So a lot of these people now see tremendous opportunities, right? Very, very reasonable. They're Polish citizens. They're serving their state. Um, but understand this also places them in very public positions, right? Um, is the way it works. It's like, oh, now all the Jews are running City Hall. Now the Jews are running, right, the licensing bureau, whatever it may be. And some, of course, are sincere communists, right? Some of them were sincere communists before the war. And again, as noted, prior to, the, to the, the war, the majority of Jews were not communists, the majority of Polish communists weren't Jews, but in the youth organizations in particular, there was a very high percentage of Jewish membership. And so, again, if you were a communist, if you were a Bundist, in many cases now, Polizio and Small, or whatever it may be, there, there's lots of opportunities here to, to you know, work on this, right? Anybody here know Merrick Edelman? Yes, of course. Um, yeah. Yeah. So Merrick Edelman, right, good. Warsaw Ghetto Uprising Leader, Bundist. Um, yeah, doctor, he's a solidarity member. He stays in Poland after the war, and he's, he's a, you know, this is his country, and he is a Marxist, right? So um, there's all kinds of, 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 of Jews who embrace these opportunities. And, and two of the most important figures in the new Polish communist government are Jews. Um, uh, there's, there's almost like a troika, right, or a triumvirate, right? You have... Uh, 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 is it Miloslav Birut, who's the president? Um, Hilary Mintz, who is, uh, but B Birut is Polish. Mintz is uh, is Jewish. Um, uh, he's the like secretary of industry, um, under secretary of the economy, or something like that, or minister of the interior, uh, minister of industry and and factories, under secretary of the economy. And, and Jakob Berman, who is the head of what basically, he's, he's got a number of roles, but he controls the security apparatus. Right. So understand from the, the Polish perspective of things. The, the man who is in charge of the secret police, Jewish, the man who's in charge of establishing cooperatives and collectives and seizing businesses and all these things, also Jewish. Um, again, important figures. Uh, Berman's brother, by the way, Adolf Berman, was an important member of, uh, of Polizio and Small, who made Aliyah and became a member of the Knesset from Apam and then um, Communist you know, Party and so forth there. But so very public figures and, and certainly not, uh, uh, not alone, right? Um, both men retained power uh, through the period from 48 through 56 or so, um, right? Even though this, there was a Stalinist crackdown on Zionists that takes place in the late 40s and early 50s, uh, Berman was arrested, but his allies in the Polish government um, basically delay his trial, and he's uh, able to resume his position after Stalin's death. So he's like in prison for a year or something like that, but you know comes back. Um, both are dismissed um, in 56, 57, not because they're Jews, but because they're Stalinists, right? When Khrushchev uh, has his famous speech in the Soviet Union, and you know you go through this sort of revisionist phase. Um, but again, very very public figures in Poland at this time. Um, and, and Polish mythology, of course, puts the Jews in control of the regime, uh, particularly the security apparatus is some truth, but much, again, it's the Jews, right? It's, it's, there are Jews playing these roles. Uh, Jews were certainly disproportionately represented in the security apparatus. Um, again, for all the reasons we discussed, um, you know, think of number of at the height, maybe 15% of the officers were Jews at a time when the Jewish population was really decimal. Um, managerial roles. Um, but again, minority, right? So the fact is, yes, Jews were disproportionately involved in the security apparatus. And this in polls I want to discuss. The majority were still polled. And I, I read a few weeks ago, or a few months ago, this, this book, very polemical. Uh, Poland's Holocaust. It's, it's, it's got some bad stuff. It's written by a Polish sociologist. And it looks at sort of what Poland goes through in the 30s, 40s, 50s with the Nazis 
and the communists, and it talks a lot about collaboration, right? And the BRICS is done by ethnic groups, what Poles did, what Ukrainians did, what Belarusians did, what Germans did, what Jews did. And it's fascinating because when the guy gets to anything involving Poles and communism, there, there's no discussion about Polish collaboration, right? That in, in Poland's mythology, um, they were simply the victims of communism, not participants in communist repression, right? So of course in their mind, well, who had to be doing it? It had to be the Jews. Um, but in real terms, the majority of collaborators in 1939, the majority of uh, party members in the 30s, the majority of members of the security efforts were all Poles, right? Not we're all Poles, but the majority were Poles, but that doesn't fit in with their own sort of victimization martyr, uh, or, or martyrdom um, mythology. Um, and again, as, as Jeff pointed out uh, quite well, again, lot, a lot of the Jews, even ones who weren't serving in the government, simply by virtue of having been in the Soviet Union, um, makes them somewhat suspect. And of course, again, there's the mythology here. Poles who've been in the Soviet Union are not necessarily viewed as suspicious. For them, it's like, oh, thank God you came back, right? Um, but, but the Jews were already suspect, and this just doubles that. Um, 1956 did say purging of Jews from the security apparatus. Um, uh, some of this was probably, again, eliminating those who'd been involved with Stalinism. Some of it was also that the new leader, Vladislav Gomulka, and, and by the way, this has been something which you saw in Poland both before World War II and after World War II. Um, discussions taking place at a high level, very secret discussions as to whether or not we have too many Jews in the high levels of the party. Not because of anti-Semitism, but because, not, not because the party was officials were anti-Semitic per se, but because their fear was that this is going to make us look bad in the Polish population, right? If we want to broaden the party's appeal, we're not going to do it with guys named uh, Mintz and Berman, uh, you know, in leadership positions. Um, so Gomulka wants to Polonize Polish communism, bring in more sort of obvious Polish officials. Um, but again, he, he's not doing this for, let's say, anti-Semitic purposes. He does open up emigration again. Uh, some 50,000 Jews left between 1956 and 1960, most going to Israel, um, which it's interesting, again, just to about this, not all saw as an improvement over Lower Silesia, right? That um, you have these Jews, some of whom have been living in very nice houses, right? These are not people leaving DP camps for Israel. Right? These are, in some cases, people leave it, leaving very nice German-built homes uh, for Israel um, and getting there and finding that, right? It, again, look, it's an interesting thing. In 19, right, timing, timing matters. If you were a Jew who comes to, uh, to Israel in, let's say, 1948, you were probably leaving a, a DP camp, let's say, in Germany, and arriving and being able to take over an Arab house, right? If you're a Jew leaving Lower Silesia in 1958, right, a decade later, you kind of flip it. You're a Jew leaving actually a nice house, in many cases, and going and being sent out to someplace in the Negev or something like that, um, in uh, some sort of, yeah, right, Mabarar or something like that. Um, and you actually have, in 1957, let's say 10,000 Jews, 12,000 Jews go to uh, Israel, about 10% asked to come back um, to Poland, um, which, again, gives you some sense, at least, that, like they weren't leaving because of persecution. Um, again, and the Polish government didn't necessarily want them back. Relatively few actually make the, the return trip, but just understand the, the complexity there. Just, uh, to the compl just if I can add to the complexity. Yeah, sure, please. Gamulka's Gamu wife was Jewish. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, well, um, I have to say, people who knew her say, if you knew her, you'd know why he became an anti-Semite. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's, it's always funny. You, you know, Wilhelm Marr was the, uh, Wilhelm Marr was the German journalist who sort of founded the German anti-Semitic political movement. And he's one of these characters who went um, through like the full gamut of, right, in his youth, a, a liberal, you know, 40 year and then a, a nationalist conservative, and then he ended up back sort of a liberal again. And it's interesting, right? Marr creates the leader at this. He first makes popular term in Germany in, in eight years so. ago. But three of his four wives of, of partial Jewish descent. And it's often said as like a, a sign like 
I don't know if you got married four times, three of your ex-wives were Jews. <laughs> that, that might explain the issues by itself like, without going into the greater details. But, um, but thank you for that addition. I'm going to, to look into that. Um, uh, you know the story when, when, when uh, Molotov, right, the Soviet foreign minister, when his wife met um, uh, Golda Meir, who was sent as the first Israeli uh, ambassador to uh, the Soviet Union. Um, and, and we'll talk about this again in some of the class. And this is in part why the Soviets turn against uh, Zionism fairly quickly. And Molotov's wife, a lifelong right, old Bolshevik, says to Golda Meir, Ich bin euch a Yiddish Tochter. Right. I'm also a Jewish daughter, which um, yeah, and she ended up in a, in a prison camp, too, but a couple of times for, for that. But 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 yeah, I think at that point, Stalin and some of these other uh, communists, like maybe we made a mistake with this Zionism thing. But anyway, um, Polish policy at this time was not anti-Semitic. Right. It wasn't particularly pro-Semitic either. Right. But just like it wasn't pro-religion. Right. I mean, um, there were Jewish periodicals, right? There were Yiddish newspapers still being published in, in Warsaw. There were national Jewish Yiddish theaters run by the Polish government. There were synagogues. Um, but again, there were no Jewish schools. Again, not because of anti-Semitism, but because, right, there were no, um, you know, sect, sectarian schools at all. There were no Catholic schools either. Um, there was still certainly, for good reason, tremendous anxiety on the part of many Jews. There was certainly anti-Semitism that could be heard on the part of Poles in the street and so forth. And, and again, not much prospect for the future, right? You're now down to, let's say, 25,000 Jews, right? Each, each decade, you see another mass migration. Um, but things were, let's say, stable for a decade, and then the Six-Day War comes along. And there's a general backlash against Zionist imperialism that should be in quotes before somebody gets mad at me. Um, uh, in the, in the Warsaw Pact, um, you also had various domestic concerns going on in Poland by various political factions. So this is an opportunity to remove whether Jewish political figures or, um, you know, uh, people who have been associated with them, wherever it may be. And you now have uh, really a, a specifically sort of anti-Semitic policy adopted where um, they're collecting names of government officials of Jewish background. Um, and obviously, look, understandable, in, in Poland in 1967 and 1968, the thought of somebody collecting the names of Jews uh, has, has a whole lot of, you know, very powerful connotations. Um, and, and again, uh, the doors are opened again, and uh, about 25,000 Jews flee the country, um, leaving behind again 5, 10, 15,000 at this point. Nobody really knows for sure, um, in large part, again, because a lot of people have been hiding uh, their Jewish ancestry for any, there, there are any number of traumatic reasons why they would, they would do that. One, one sort of funny thing, though, you know, 67, 68 are times of great political ferment in, in Eastern Europe in general, including Poland, and that's part of what's going on here. Um, and while the Polish government's view is hostile, and part, one of the reasons why the Polish government's view is hostile, was because in 1967, in the wake of the Six Day War, public sentiment in Poland is extraordinarily uh, pro-Israel for, for the funny reason that in their view, our Jews have defeated their Arabs, right? Our being Poland, their being the Soviets. And so, right, you do have, again, how these things play out, and we'll talk more about this later. But yeah, this, this sense from the Poles that like, our guys did good, right? Oh. Yeah. Um, so Jewish life in Poland was extraordinarily moribund, right? So much so that even Chabad didn't operate there. Um, uh, then came the 90s. And Can I interrupt for a minute? Yeah. Okay. So um, my mentor, Lucian Dabrzycki. Ooh. I ah. don't know the Ooh. name. Okay. Yeah, I do know the name. So, Okay, so what I learned from him was, his feeling always was that the Jews who remained in Poland um, after the war were not particularly Soviet or communist oriented. They saw themselves as Polonized. Now that may be, that may be his vision of himself. I mean, 
Of course, right. certainly he was a very Polonized Jew. Um, he was forced to leave in 68. Um, he was in Israel doing some research. When he, when he disembarked in Poland, he was met at the airport, taken to the American embassy where his wife and daughter were already in uh, security and custody. And his feeling was this was, if I'm remembering correctly, um, that finally uh, Polish anti-Semitism, which is something that he was not keen on recognizing, um, came to the forefront. And, yeah. it, and the anti-Zionism was really anti-Semitic. Yeah, so, so there was, by this point, the head of the interior ministry, which also controls the security apparatus, this guy, uh, Mokhtar, who was an anti-Semitic, right? So, Gavolka, who, who still was, was again, was, right, was just going along with it, but there, there were, at this point, again, actual important political figures who were pushing uh, an actual sort of anti-Semitic um, agenda. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, so so look, the nineties come along, and 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 certainly uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union, and, and it involved there were some prominent Jews. Uh, Edelman, we mentioned before, Adam Michnik, um, uh from a Jewish family, uh, who were fairly prominent figures. Michnik wins office. These guys are involved with with um, solidarity. Um, you know, very publicly. Uh, on the other hand, already in the first elections, right, it's a, it's a mixed thing. And the one that you have Jews like Michnik who are winning office. On the other hand, already in, you know, 1989 or 90, whenever the first uh, elections were, Polish politicians of, of impeccable non-Jewish credentials are being accused of being secret Jews. And th this becomes sort of a, a big part of sort of Polish culture since then, right? Because so many Jews were sort of incognito and in hiding and underground, like openly underground, I mean, like, you know, hiding their identities, you know, the idea of the, the, the secret hidden Jew has become sort of a, a, almost a new element in Polish culture in a way that it wouldn't have been, let's say, 100 years ago, right? You knew who the Jews were in uh, Poland in the 1930s because they looked and sounded like Jews, right? Um, in the... Uh, you know, the 21st century, right, the, the insidiousness of the Jews, of course, is that they've, you know, been able to infiltrate Polish society this way. Um, and it is, a, look, it is a fascinating phenomenon um, where, you know, suddenly people who knew they were Jewish but kept it secret, people who didn't know that they were Jewish or of Jewish descent, but whose parents say to them now in 1993 or whatever it is, by the way, I'm Jewish, um, start to appear. And, and Polish Jewry develops a, look, because of this, you know, you have many people who are involved in the Polish Jewish community are not halakhically Jewish, right? Um, given the demographics of Poland and the experience that Poles went through, um, you know, not terribly surprising, but um, you, you have the opening of schools, synagogues are reopened. Um, the old fear of the Jews coming back and taking property comes up again, though, right? I mean, it's always fascinating to me. You'd have these documentaries in like the 1990s showing like Jews going back to their hometowns in Poland, and you can see the concern of the Poles, like uh, you're, you're not taking your house back, are you, right? It's, it's always funny, like you have some Pole who's living in what, what, what is basically some kind of hovel, and this Jew is a millionaire from Long Island now, but the Pole is concerned the Jew is going to reclaim his home. Um, but there is lots of obviously Jewish property there that, that is theoretically valuable. Um, so this creates tensions in Poland as well. Um, but yeah, you have people who are, are, are discovering their Polish heritage, our Jewish heritage. You also have this, again, bizarre story in Poznan, um, uh, Posen in German, where this, this guy appears, seemingly a Hasidic guy, um, claims to be a rabbi from Israel, um, and manages for months to basically become the, the rabbi of the Jewish community of, of Poznan. And it turns out he's just some Polish guy who'd been a, a cook who developed, I don't know if it's a psychosis or whatever it may be, um, he couldn't speak Hebrew. He would read like Hebrew, but in, in like Polish, uh, um, you know, when, when you have like, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Phonetics, like phonetically written out. Um, 
And in Poznan, the, the Jewish community itself, they, they were so, this is only 2016, by the way, um, they had so little sort of grasp of what was going on that they couldn't really necessarily challenge him. Even other rabbis who met him, like, I don't know if they just thought he was a weird, a kook, if they thought he was just some Jew who, um, you know, had a delusion. But he did a lot of stuff, right? That's the thing. He made dinner for the community. He, he, he was like the Jeff Katz of, uh, of post-non Jewry. Now that I'm saying it, I'm wondering, Jeff, do we need to, do we need to check I your to change my look? <laughs> right, right, right. Jeff Katz, let's see. Delusions of being a Jewish leader? For, <laughs> but, um, but, but yeah, and then, and then some Polish journalist basically outed him. But it, it's funny, Michael Shudrick, who's the, the chief rabbi of Poland, is the guy sitting here next to the cardinal. He was asked about this, and he said, like, I met the guy a few times. He seemed really friendly and smiley. I, you know, uh, none of these people, like, I called him on, and obviously they could tell that he couldn't speak Hebrew and so forth. But, but Shudrick says something interesting uh, and kind of charming, which is like, look, we should look at the positive side. That, that who could have imagined, right, 30 or 40 years ago or 70 or whatever it is, that any Pole would pretend to be a Jew, <laughs> right? Meaning that the very fact that this guy would, would, would be choosing to dress up like a Hasid and walk around in Poland is itself a sort of like heartening sign. Um, but again, you have these weird tensions, right? Jews come to Poland, Jews bring a lot of tourist money to Poland, but it, it's like the worst form of tourism, right? Like from the perspective of a lot of Poles, right? These, these busloads of Jews come to Poland and they're not interested in Polish culture. They're interested in Poland as an abattoir, right? I mean, you know, and in that sense for people who are already extraordinarily prickly about their history and about their war and about their relationship with the you know, Jews and anti-Semitism. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is, um, a, a, a real kind of, uh, well, and I, and I got to figure a lot of these Jewish tourists are probably not, especially the Israelis, right? They're necessarily putting the, the best face forward on, uh, on, you know, Jewish Polish relations. So that's certainly a sign of, of tension and hostility as well. Um, but there's this weird thing that's happened in Polish culture in the last 30 years. This sort of it, nostalgia for Jewish culture, which manifests itself in a lot of strange ways, right? You have Polish klezmer bands, right? Sometimes dressed in kind of kind of Jewy, right, garb. Um, not a Jew among them, but playing klezmer music. You have um, a, a growth in these uh, zidki, um, like good luck Jewish statues, which are an old, are an old full Polish sort of folk thing, but now become again a big tourist thing, right? Buying these these little statues of Jews sometimes with weird little anti-Semitic things, like here's a Jew with like a pig's head. Uh, sometimes a Jew with money. Um, I guess it's good luck; it'll bring you money. But now you have more like Jews dancing and Hasidim and so forth. You have Jewish restaurants, not not kosher restaurants, but Polish Jewish restaurants. Here's and I love this again: the Mazel Tov restaurant in Kielce, Poland. Right, so the site of the infamous pogrom restaurant, again, no Jew involved in, and I just read in preparation of this class this uh, uh, anecdote by Konstanty Gibbert, who's a Jewish journalist in Poland, who's a very powerful activist, he'd been involved in solidarity and all this stuff. Um, he said he'd gone to one of these restaurants and there, there, were, there were Jewish Jewish style pork chops. And he said, what, what, what's Jewish about this? Garlic. Right, meaning that that uh, and it's something we don't think about, but garlic was, of course, a a uh, Jewish spice, which was again a definitively Jewish spice. Is why what, what makes a kosher dill a kosher dill? Garlic, which was not heavily used in uh, in Polish cuisine. And for those who know me, understand why this is my favorite part of this, because it ties in with so many things that I, I like. Um, Jewish vodka. So, you know, as I mentioned in earlier classes, historically speaking, Jews were the distillers in Poland for a thousand years. Um, and you develop this kind of nostalgic mythology that the good vodka, the old school vodka was the Jewish vodka, right? This is the vodka that's pure, 
right? Ties into the kosher thing too. Vodka that doesn't give you a hangover, right? And so starting in the 90s, you would have these, and it still goes on, these weird vodka companies and brands. Uh, you have Rebecca Vodka, Magilla. Um, I, I remember getting a bottle of Queen Esther Vodka, um, which is very funny because, because it was allegedly made with, with the old recipe of the Nissenbaum family. <laughs> right, Nissenbaum kosher vodka, but they had on the label because it was Nissenbaum and kosher, uh, Nis kosher. Nis kosher. <laughs> Which again, if you know a little Yiddish, sounds a lot like Nis kosher, not kosher. Um, but but yeah, these 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 things that tap into this notion that this is the real, authentic, old school vodka that you can't get anymore. Um, so it, it you know. It's a weird thing, and, and I, I'd say that if you want, you could say that in, in some respects, the, the Polish relationship that exists before the war, in, in some weird sort of shadows of it still exist, right? Um, on the one hand, you have this tension and hostility, Christian anti-Judaism, anti-Semitism, economic envy, uh, existing side by side with a cultural and cul culinary appreciation, um, the addition of Polish resentment and how the history of Polish Jewish relations is presented, combined with their own desire to sort of create their own usable Polish Jewish past. Um, so you have these weird like elements of old Polish Jewish relations, um, but these new elements in a country that um, has still very few Jews, but still some or another for Poles and Jews alike, sort of retains this extraordinarily uh, powerful hold. Um, and then that's what I got to say, but I'm extraordinarily happy to uh, answer questions or discuss things, whatever it may, may be. In a way, it's like... So, when, so if, if, <clears throat> when in Krakow, I, there was a restaurant that, uh, of course, there was klezmer and they served cholent. And the cholent, of course, was pork. And, <laughs> and all the waiters were wearing capotas and streimloch. Yeah, and with, with fake payas. And, you know, I, I, it just was... The most bizarre, and this was across from the Ramah synagogue. <laughs> it, it just was the most bizarre thing, but it, it you know, somehow Jewish Ramah tourists somehow gravitate to this. I don't know. Uh, they like it. But well, let, let me say, okay. uh, I, agree with, thing. Yeah. I agree with everything you said about the curious nature of Polish feelings towards Jews, but it's very complicated. For example, it's true that you see a lot of kitschy stuff about Jews and you hear a lot of kitschy stuff about Jews. Right. On the other hand, it's also the case that among Polish academics and intellectuals in the 90s, they really spent a lot of time and effort learning about Polish Jewish history. And many of them were very sincerely concerned about the, to, to get to the, yeah, the, yeah, the, I'm not even the story. So you yeah. meet and likewise, also in the Polish church, you meet, uh, there are Catholic figures in Poland that are noticeably anti-Semitic. On the other hand, uh, the church, uh, the official national church in Poland has one day a year, which is devoted to studying Judaism. And they run real seminars and lectures and courses on it. And there are people that take those uh, quite seriously also. So it's, it's a very complicated picture. I will say this, by the way, about Poznan, I've lectured in Poznan. I've been a visiting professor there, but I wasn't there over Shabbos. So I didn't get to meet the Jewish <laughs> so community. So I'm not holding you accountable. Yeah, but the, uh, the shul, there is a grand old shul building in Poznan, right near the beautiful uh, square in the middle, the town square in the middle. Unfortunately, the building was defaced by the Nazis. They took off all the decorative stuff around the building and just the core of it was left. And the communists turned it into a swimming pool, a public swimming pool. The Jewish community then got it back, uh, but it's going to be a huge restoration job, which I don't know if it'll ever be done for the small number of Jews who actually yeah. uh, well, live well, there. You know what, Jeff? It it's, sounds more uh, and more like uh, the paradoxes. You know, yeah, I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. I didn't go. I didn't go into sort of the, the intellectual culture um, or even the religious culture. Look, the fact that I think that really had a huge role, obviously, in, in the, the larger Catholic world about its approach to Judaism and the Jews. But, but certainly, I think for, for Polish Catholicism, um, right, he, 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 he was a game changer. Right, right, right. Hold on, I got to... 
Um, you know, I, um, when I was in Warsaw, I noticed that practically every other block had some kind of memorial to Jews and the Holocaust, which I, I found very moving. And I also found out that most of them were put up post-communist occupation of Poland. So I thought that was very interesting and, um, and, and very moving. But I wonder at this point, what's your feeling about the, the present Polish government? Oh, well, look, I, I do think that, you know, this becomes one of those things, hold on, I gotta let my dog out of the room. Uh, leaving, buddy? That I think the present government is, I, I, look, I don't think it's an anti-Semitic government. I think it is a, a government that wants to have good relations with Israel, certainly. It wants to have good relations with the United States, certainly. I think that as with, you know, sort of a lot of things, you know, it, it's complicated because it is um, So, you know, in terms of who wants or why, you know, I, I think that the, the the recent vote on right banning uh, shkita and uh, and uh, um, halal slaughter for export uh, is complicated um, because again you you certainly have negative feelings about Jews. You also have positive feelings about animals. Right? These these two things can exist, you know, side by side. Um, I too have negative feelings about many Jews and very positive feelings about animals. Um, uh, they're not banning shkita in Poland, right? Which is an important distinction, I'd say. And I also think that in general, with a lot of the European stuff, um, I, I think it's interesting because you know it goes back to what we talked about last week when we spoke about Jews and their relationship with the other national minorities in in in, uh, in uh, Poland. I think a lot of a lot of what is what ends up negatively affecting Jews now is because of governments or politicians that are trying to target Islam specifically, right? So again, it's hard sometimes to make the distinction, but if you want to make a place uncomfortable for Muslims, um, cracking down on halal, cracking down on circumcision, cracking down on wearing religious garb, that's all going to crack down on Muslims. But as I pointed out, when it rains, Jews get wet, right? And this is a situation where all those same things are going to affect Jews, uh, even though I, I don't know that in some of these cases, it's necessarily what they're trying to accomplish. Great. I appreciate, I appreciate your view on that. And also, of course, I, I didn't, I, I, I couldn't tune in last week, but the idea of banning Shrita is not new. That we're going to do that, you know. Yeah, in 1936 or so. Right. So that's not. Yeah. You know, one of the things that you... Uh, I think that you didn't mention, which I, I thought was, which I think is, is, is this is why I'm not fond of Jews, because I, I, I spend hours making this class, I deliver this lovely lecture, and all I can say is the thing I didn't mention. <laughs> no, I just want to, I think it would add to your presentation yeah. that in the years of 1940, from 46 to, to until the Iron Curtain really came down, the uh, Radio for Europe, uh, the Allies were asking Jews to come into the DP camps. There was this movement in, and, you'd, and this movement out of Poland and out of Eastern Europe through Poland to come to Germany, to the DP camps. And that was a, there was a mass movement of that. So Poland was being emptied. I mean, you've made a case for how these, the settlement was in, in Gross Rosen was established, but there were there was that kind of constant movement across the border into what was then Western Germany and into those, those camps. I am happy to concede my ignorance of- No, it's not ignorant. No, I just think- No, 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 no. I, say, I, I don't know anything about it for you. Oh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm saying thank you. I'm happy to- yeah. It's a very important migration. It wasn't just to Israel. It was also to the West. And that, and that gave them the opportunity to do a few things, either to go to the West, the United States or Canada yeah. or, what, or to Israel. At that point, yeah. but from that point, yeah. You all good, right? It was great, great. David. Thank you, thank you so much. So, Terrific. I'll do some other classes in a, in a, in a few weeks, but I, I gotta take Terrific. a break. Terrific. 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 Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mara right. Thank you, thank you, beautiful. Thank you so much. Bye. Good night, good night, good night, good night, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.
גמר חתימה טובה.